Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft. These are the three gods of our realm, older than time itself. To these gods, we gamers pay tribute, for they control everything known to mankind. Well, I guess there's also Valve, Epic, and Blizzard, but we're not talking about the false messiahs. We're talking about good old-fashioned consoles. Who knows where I'd be in life today if I never owned a Nintendo 64. I'm tired of reading books! What friendships would have never flourished if I hadn't played Halo 3 on the Xbox 360? Each one of these bad boys is like a time capsule, a piece of gaming history that I can always plug in and play to relive the good times. I may have tossed out my old computers, toys, sold my Beanie Babies collection, but I've always saved a spot on my shelves for these consoles. It's hard to imagine a time where game stores sold anything but products from the three titans. Welcome to Blockbuster, how can I help you? Hi, I'd like to rent Gex for the 3DO. What the fuck is that? But back in the 80s and even 90s, the competition was far more diverse. Back then, consumers didn't have enough experience with this type of product to know what was awesome and what sucked ass. Kind of astounding, the vast majority of home consoles were released during the very first generation of gaming. A lot of it was just the same crap. It was an oversaturated nightmare that would end with the video game crash of 1982, and everyone learned a valuable lesson about quality control. Or so we all thought. If you want to rip and tear your way into the games industry, it's do or die. You either strike gold or get stuck with coal. Let me toss some numbers at you. It's reported that 10% of published games generated 90% of the revenue. Around 3% of PC games and 15% of console games reach more than 100,000 sales per year. Only 20% of all games make any profit. What? That's how cutthroat this business is. Now, most of these consoles I don't own, so I can't give you first-hand experience with them. Which is kind of the point, right? I mean, it wouldn't be a failed console if I owned it. Did I mention I'm the act man? Now, I'm also not about to spend $500 to experience the magic of playing the Wand of Gamelon in its original form. <laughs> it wasn't until the early 2000s when the whole world gathered at the United Nations and agreed these three would be our new gods, and all other religions would be forgotten. But why is it like this now? Why is it so hard to make a successful home console? These are tough questions, but I wouldn't be the act man if I couldn't answer them. So hop aboard my magic school bus and let me take you on a history lesson. It's time to take a look back at the biggest console flops in history and find out where and why they went wrong. But first, what's that? Is it a bird? A plane? No. It's the Ad Man, and he's playing Pascal's Wager. What a hero. Pascal's Wager is a premium action adventure game with tense combat and invigorating boss battles. Taking place in a dark fantasy land, you'll encounter tons of different monsters. Get back, you fiends! Originally made for mobile devices, Pascal's Wager has been updated and ported to Steam. I gotta say folks, as a mobile game, this is a huge accomplishment. But it's even better on PC, because the Definitive Edition comes with all the bonus content and expansions. Ah! Not to mention 4K resolution, uncapped frame rate, there's an engaging talent tree, progression that makes you feel stronger. While it has some similarities to Dark Souls, it's actually really unique, because you can swap between different characters and playstyles. Wanna be a dude who swings a coffin around? You can do that. And there's a ton of really unique mechanics. Attacking bosses will cause this insanity debuff to increase. And if you don't use items to get rid of it, the boss will transform, get new moves, and become stronger. That's awesome, it's like an optional second phase. Honestly, I was really surprised with Pascal's Wager, and there's a lot more to it. I barely scratched the surface. So check it out, folks. Buy Pascal's Wager today using the link in the description and the pinned comment. And thanks to Pascal's Wager for sponsoring this video. Virtual Boy, a 3D game for a 3D world. 
want to play. It's definitely a no for me, dog. If you had a time machine, what would you do? Maybe go back and stop Hitler from rising to power? Prevent the JFK assassination? If it were me, I'd go back to 1995 and destroy all prototypes of the Virtual Boy. In 1995, the Game Boy was kicking ass. Nintendo had barely emerged victorious from the 16-bit wars against Sega, and Project Reality, aka the N64, was on its way. But like DJ Khaled, Nintendo was suffering from success, and thus spawned a brilliant idea. Virtual Reality. It was a mind-blowing concept at the time. You could even say it was virtually unheard of. <laughs> Virtual Boy is so advanced it can't be viewed on conventional TV or LCD screens. Yeah, it couldn't be viewed on conventional TVs because it caused eye strain. My eyes! My beautiful eyes! Oh, yes. Nintendo paid $10 million for the technology to develop the Virtual Boy. The problem was they released it unfinished. Now, this would be totally acceptable today, but back then games and game consoles actually had to be complete. <laughs> It's essentially a primitive VR headset of what we have now, except the design is atrocious. The first question you probably have is, how the hell do I play this? Is there a head strap? Is the stand adjustable in any way? Is there anything to make playing this even slightly comfortable? No. You'd have to slouch like a gremlin just to get line of sight. The first thing you can screw up with a console is its design. But the second, there weren't many titles that could take advantage of this 3D technology, and the ones that tried could easily be replicated on an older system. If you compare Red Alarm to Star Fox on Super Nintendo, there's no competition. The Virtual Boy had a mediocre, minuscule lineup of games. And did anyone really want to look at this for more than 30 minutes? If you like monochrome and the color red, buy a Virtual Boy. That's what the ad should have said. Now, it was promoted as a portable console. What, were people expected to bring this to the freaking park? The advertising showed some kid lying down on the grass. Who the hell wants to play games like that? And if you wanted a portable console... Introducing Game Boy. That's the thing, so many of these consoles failed simply because there was a better alternative. Why risk your money investing in an experimental piece of tech when you can go with what is established and works? Today, the Virtual Boy is nothing more than a curious piece of gaming history. While it was a huge stain on Nintendo's reputation for a while, some good did come out of it. Wario Land would spawn a couple sequels and eventually get his own franchise. Not content with wasting potentially great ideas, the 3D effect was reinvented with the 3DS. Failed gaming consoles have so much to teach us, and I find the Virtual Boy so interesting because 26 years later, virtual reality is still a niche market. It makes you wonder if it'll ever be mainstream. But you want to see something more recent and relatable, huh? Don't you? Well, I got you. Stadia is only the newest, most logic defined, mind bending, absurd gaming platform on Earth! The lie detector determined that was a lie. <laughs> With all the profits to be had in gaming, of course one of the biggest tech companies would try to dive in. How hard could it be? I remember going to PAX West in 2019 and Google had a booth where you could play Doom Eternal. The guy there told me all about the console, how it worked, and why it was so cool and revolutionary. And after about five minutes of him talking, I just sat there and I was like, I don't have a clue what you're talking about, Phil, not a fucking clue. I didn't understand the concept then, and I still don't now. All I can say is playing Doom Eternal on Stadia was like gaming on a 10-year-old computer. From what I understand, it's like a cloud gaming thing. Google has all their servers around the world, and instead of needing a high-end PC to play games at max settings, you just buy a Stadia and the server streams it to your computer. Of course, if you claim your system can run every game at 4K, and your system can't run every game at 4K, well, there's a wee bit of a problem there, lad. You might even get hit with a class action loss. Objection! And boom goes the dynamite. The Stadia's performance was entirely based on your internet connection. When it launched, most people realized it wasn't everything Google made it out to be. Many called it a beta product and said that it should have been labeled as such. Users also found their complaints fell on deaf ears as Google wasn't really keen on this thing called communication. Well, that's strike three. If you can't be honest and straightforward with what the game plan is, how you're going to address major complaints and fix this shit, I don't want any part of it. 
I'm not gonna sit around waiting for you to figure it out. It also doesn't help to be selling a mandatory subscription service alongside. Strike 4 is when the creative director tweets out some shitty hot takes about how streamers should be buying a license to play and stream games. And I know it's your opinion, but your opinion's wrong. This just demonstrates how out of touch the developers for Stadia really are. Guess it doesn't matter since Google pulled the plug on developing games entirely. What a shame. Also, the Stadia platform doesn't have a search option, and it's made by Google. Tom, if irony were made of strawberries, we'd all be drinking a lot of smoothies right now. Now this is another factor of console failure, releasing a product in a market where that need is already met. Epic Games and Blizzard were able to make their own clients and platforms pretty successful because of the name and brand behind it, as well as the quality of games. Steam, of course, has been well established for 15 years. Stadia has no real exclusives. But what's real frightening is how a massive company like Google couldn't break into the game industry. The sales pitch of the Stadia was just too confusing. I still don't get what the appeal is, and I don't think I need to. The CD-ROM? Funny you should mention the CD-ROM. Oh? CD I hear has everything you'd get in a CD-ROM, except the problems. Are you sure about that? In this humble acting male's opinion, there might be no bigger piece of crap than the Philips CDI. I hope she made lots of spaghetti, 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 spaghetti. This monstrosity was massive in size, and it retailed for $800 in 1990. That's equal to $1,380 today. Holy shit, shit. What do you get for paying a blood sacrifice? You're pretty good, here. Yeah. Thanks. Now, it was marketed as a multimedia device that could play games, music, etc. Kind of like how the Xbox One was promoted. The problem is nobody wanted or needed this type of hardware. What's the first thing you notice about this CDI? Spaghetti! Well, it looks like a VCR, not a game console. Who designed the look of this? Where's the personality? It arguably has the worst controller I've ever seen. Who would want to use this with all the buttons crowded around? The only thing the CDI had going for it was the license to use Nintendo's IPs to develop their own games. Ha <laughs> ha, here's the problem, too many toasters. You know what they say, all toasters toast toast. Should I say anything else? Do, do I need to play more cutscenes until the message sinks in? What a wasted opportunity. I don't think Nintendo has ever licensed its IPs out to competitors since the CDI. And for good reason. The CDI failed because of its unintuitive, horrible controls, absurd asking price, and selection of dog shit games. Although the CDI is considered one of the worst consoles ever, it did one thing right. Push the industry a little bit towards CD-based games. And for that, you can give it the tiniest amount of credit. We wanted to make a great product. Looks like there's been a change of plans. For all the consoles on this list, none are as depressing as the Ouya. The CDI and Virtual Boy may have been giant hunks of feces, but at least they didn't start a crowdfunding campaign to make them. Ouya Company sought less than a million dollars, but ended up getting over 8.5. It really struck a chord with people. Maybe this could be a new challenger to rival the big three. The biggest appeal was its cheap price at 99 bucks, but also, you'd get hundreds of games free to try. Play a demo without committing the money. Wow! And the designers made it with the intention of letting people mod it? How cool! It was compatible with other controllers? Wowee! Ouya was supposed to collaborate with big developers and already had deals with Sega and Square Enix? There were so many features to get excited about. The Ouya was a really cool sales pitch. Almost too good to be true. Because it was. None of the Kickstarters got Nuya when they were promised to. There was no killer app. The selection of games was a total joke. Which, by the way, stay tuned for my two-hour review of Rain. Just like Julie Ehrman said, There is nothing special about this board. Nothing. There was nothing special about this. Once people did get their long-awaited Ouya, they immediately noticed how terrible the controller was. With sticky buttons, a stiff D-pad, horrible latency, 
They even priced the controller at 50 bucks. Half the cost of the console? Within months, the whole thing fell apart. The jig was up, sales were poor, and every exciting promise they made soon turned to ash. Games were no longer free to try like all of the marketing promoted, and developers weren't willing to make such huge sacrifices for the glory of having their game featured on the freaking Ouya. The free the games fund the company set up was plagued with scammers. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. While the Ouya could be commended for having promising ideals, it just wasn't realistic. People behind the project were inexperienced, unable to deliver, and handled everything so poorly that to this day, it still has left a bitter taste in everyone's mouth. Ouya was then sold to Razer as they had no way to repay investors and the whole thing just was abandoned like that. Another curious reminder of how oppressive the game industry can be for those unprepared. Presenting 3DO, the most advanced home gaming system in the universe. Only in the game industry could you sell 2 million consoles and still be considered a failure. But that's because the 3DO had goals that were unreachable. Founded by Trip Hawkins, former CEO of EA, yeah! the 3DO company wanted to create a console that would dominate the market and set a new standard. They even had the balls to throw shade directly at Nintendo and Sega. This is a real man's console, bro. Trying to be cool by talking shit on things people enjoy is a pretty terrible idea if you can't back up the trash talk. Sony and Sega were both approached by the 3DO company to license the console. Both declined. A wise move. You have chosen wisely. This damn thing was overhyped to the extreme, with massive marketing campaigns, infomercials, it was Time Magazine's 1993 product of the year. The 3DO boasted cutting edge technology and claimed to be the most advanced console in the universe. It owned this title for a year. And then the PlayStation came out. You had to cough up $700, which would be 1,274 bucks today. Oh, but guess how many games the 3DO launched with? Take, take a guess, one guess. One. It launched with one game. Imagine paying 1,300 bucks to play Crash and Burn. Unlike most other consoles on this list, the 3DO had a chance at real success. Later down the line, it got some decent games like Gex and Wing Commander. The console wasn't the problem, the business model was. Most consoles are sold at a loss for profit, but make up for it with hardware sales. The 3DO was trying to profit off console sales. To my knowledge, the only other product that tried that was the 360, and that's why there were so many red ring of deaths. It's not a good business model. 3DO wasn't an established company, and the price didn't drop fast enough for many to consider buying it. The timing was off. Gamers weren't willing to upgrade with the Sega Saturn and PS1 on the way. It's actually impressive that 3DO sold as well as it did, considering it became antiquated within a year. The 3DO serves as a lesson in business practices. You can have third-party support, great games, a powerful piece of hardware, and an insane marketing campaign, but without proper timing and a more widespread appeal, it's damn near impossible to gain a foothold. Six times more powerful than 3DO. Alright, baby. Forty times more than Super NES. By far the company that tragically holds the record for most failed consoles is none other than Sega. At one time they stood against Nintendo as equals. They had tons of reputable IPs at their disposal. To put it plainly, the Genesis was just cool. But after, Sega made so many mistakes. The first being confusion about what their next gen console would be. Within a few years, Sega announced the Sega CD, the 32X, the Saturn, and had a third add-on planned for the Genesis called the Neptune. Which one are people supposed to get or be excited about? The Sega CD didn't perform terribly for an add-on, but their biggest pitfall was a lack of focus. Not only were the consoles being mismanaged, but their games were too. Sonic Extreme was hyped up so much and could have been the mirror image of Super Mario 64, but it was killed by rush deadlines. And for many years, the Sonic franchise would suffer setback after setback. 
While Sega couldn't get their ducks in a row, Nintendo and Sony were thriving in the vacuum of their former success. The nail in the coffin came at E3 1995, where they announced the price of the Sega Saturn. Hear ye, hear ye, it's only $3.99. And then Sony comes out and says, $2.99. You destroyed that guy without even touching him. The Dreamcast was Sega's last shot, but at this point, it was too late. The Sega brand had been tarnished in the last five years, while Sony became the new rival to Nintendo. And with Microsoft ready to jump into the fray with the Xbox, there was little room for Sega. Were things a bit different, they might still be selling their own brand of consoles to this day. And had they not realized they were digging themselves into a financial hole, Sega could have gone the way of Atari. Luckily, the company remains alive and in good health, developing tons of outstanding games. Sonic has more or less reclaimed his throne after years of terrible video games. This is one of the few stories where redemption was earned. Time to upgrade to... Wii U. How about new? I maybe booted up my Wii U 60 times before I boxed it up, put it on my shelf, and never touched it again. Well, would you look at that? Since the GameCube, PS2, and OG Xbox, Nintendo has always been behind the competition in terms of technology, this thing called online play, but they've been able to succeed because their games kick so much ass, and the culture they've created has turned millions of people into hardcore fans. But their greatest weaknesses would become impossible to ignore with the Wii U. Following the outrageous success of the Wii, Nintendo must have thought, let's just make a sequel. We would like to play. Again. Are you sure the novelty of the Wii won't have worn off in the six years since it came out? No, it's all good. It was not all good. And the console sold terribly. No amount of promotion or amazing titles could save it from mediocre performance. The console was the problem, not the games. The gamepad, while interesting, wasn't half as impressive as the Wii's motion controls, and Nintendo didn't have enough creative ways to use it. The worst example being Paper Mario Color Splash and how fucking tedious it was to make an attack in a turn-based game. The X-Bone and PS4 just outclassed the Wii U. Third-party companies would have to severely downscale their titles to work on the Wii U, so most of them didn't bother. The Wii U wasn't a portable console, nor did it push the boundaries of technology. Only established fans of Nintendo would buy one. The Wii U was also considerably more expensive than previous Nintendo consoles, not to mention the absurdly low storage of 8 gigabytes. Ooh. That's kind of small. PS4 and Xbox One were also multimedia devices capable of doing more than just gaming. Why couldn't you just compete, huh? Huh? Luckily, Nintendo licked their wounds and pounced right back with the Switch, which is kind of what the Wii U was building up to. But the Switch was genius because it now fulfilled the roles of portable and home consoles, two markets that Nintendo was always kind of competing with itself. Instead of focusing on two separate platforms, the Wii U and the 3DS, Nintendo is doing damn good, focusing on one that does both. What the hell was that? Many titans have put on the gloves and jumped into the ring, and Apple was one of them. They made two critical mistakes, giving Halo to Microsoft, and allow me to introduce you to the Apple Pippin. Now what in fuck's name is that? Well, it was supposed to be a multimedia platform that could play games, browse the web. There was a PAL switch on the back that would eliminate region lock. Hot damn, that technology must have been revolutionary in 1996. The Pippin was a piece of software that Apple would license to other companies, and they partnered with Bandai, who predicted to sell half a million a year, with the goal of bringing this type of software into households that hadn't bought personal computers yet. That was the, the sales pitch. One of the arguments over the future of home computing is will we add computing power to our television sets, or will we add TV capability to our personal computers? Apple is betting that the TV will be the preferred viewing device with a new approach to home computing called Pippin. But like every other Apple product, it was horribly overpriced. 
At 600 big boys, it was triple the price of the N64 and double the PlayStation. Think about it. In the 90s, the internet wasn't nearly as popular as it is today. In December of 1996, less than 1% of the world's population used the internet. The Pippin wanted to be an inexpensive computer and a game console, but it wasn't good at either. So not many people even understood the concept. In the end, the Pippin only released 25 titles and sold between 42,000 and 100,000 units. There wasn't much room for a new contender alongside the PS1, N64, and Saturn, especially one that didn't cater to hardcore gamers. Apple is doing just fine though and their gaming market is probably the biggest on the planet. So don't feel bad when you point the finger and laugh at the Apple Pippin. This is kind of a depressing video, huh? Running through people's aspirations and dreams and reliving their collapse? Well, there's no better segue to talk about Atari. Some of you believe your system is the most advanced in the universe. Let's review the numbers. Sega Genesis is 16 bits. 3DO is 32 bits. The Atari Jaguar is 64 bits. Which is more advanced? Clifford! Hmm? In the 80s, they were the king of gaming, and to this day, are still fondly remembered. The 2600 was one of the first big steps in bringing gaming to the household. But the 2600 would be Atari's greatest success. Following this, they launched a series of commercially unsuccessful consoles like the Lynx, the 5200, the 7800. But in 1993, Atari was pleased to announce a console better than the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. It was 64 bits! The Atari Jaguar! Holy tits, this has got to be the most powerful console in the world! It was not the most powerful console in the world. It really was a case of misleading marketing as it ran two separate 32-bit processors that they were like, well, 32 plus 32 is 64. Doesn't work like that. Gamers were shocked to find the quality was worse than its competitors. And look at this monster of a controller. Was it really necessary to add a keypad in? This isn't the 80s anymore. This thing makes the Duke look like a micro penis. There were only 50 licensed titles. The console's small size, technical problems, and lack of quality games were the biggest factors of its failure. Atari desperately tried to stay relevant by creating the Jaguar CD, but this only sped up their rapid decline. The Jaguar sold about 250K units, and its failure resulted in Atari leaving the console business forever. A sad end to a beloved company. Some of you might be familiar with Mattel Electronics. If you're a hundred years old, then you know that they created the Intellivision, a console that predates even the legendary Atari 2600. For 27 years, Mattel did not release a new console, and they really shouldn't have ever tried to. The new Hyperscan video game system is here, featuring X-Men. It's where collectible card games meet video games. This is the worst console design. I've ever seen. You know, most games were either discs, cartridges, but cards? Who thought that was a good idea? You can barely even scan them to get it to work. Its design is so terrible, it can't even stand up on a table properly. This atrocity competed against the 360 Wii and PS3, so it's no wonder it never gained any kind of traction. Imagine getting one of these for Christmas. Fuck you, Grandma! Of the 10,000 that were sold, a vast majority of them were returned because the failure rate was so high. Even though it was only 70 bucks, that still didn't help. Near the end of its lifespan, stores were selling this damn thing for 10 bucks. The only value anybody can get out of this now is making a video on how terrible it was. But it also had the longest load times of any console ever. Only five games were ever released. And you want to take a guess as to what they looked like? Yeah, you've seen Flash games better than this. Overall, the Hyperscan is known for one thing and one thing only. Being the biggest piece of shittest thing ever. Kind of surprising that Nintendo has three consoles on this list. It's not nearly as ridiculous as Duke Nukem Forever, but the DD was still a serious case of vaporware. It was pretty ambitious, made as an add-on for the N64. It utilized a disk drive with increased storage to make games bigger and better, it was going to be able to emulate NES games, and would even have an online multiplayer for simple games like Mahjong. You could even spectate other people. The 64DD, like the Pippin, was trying to bridge the gap between internet and gaming, which was real tough at the time. However, the 64DD was marred by development hell. 
publicly revealed in November 1996. Six long months later, Nintendo announces a delay, with no comment on an American release. June 18th, the pre-E3 press conference. Any news on the DD? Nope, not even a prototype. But good news, everyone. Nintendo is developing Donkey Kong 64 for the DD and is planning a sequel to Super Mario 64? Holy shit! Hype levels at maximum capacity! Six months later, December 1997, Miyamoto gives an interview and comments on how he's having trouble making sense of what the 64DD is meant to be. That's not a good sign. Yet another delay is announced. Don't worry guys, it's gonna come out in 1998, trust us. The DD makes no appearance at E3 and Nintendo cancels its Space World 1998 trade show. April 3rd, 98. Nintendo says it's gonna launch within the year. If it has a sequel to Super Mario 64, I'm on board. One year later, another fucking delay. But at least it's coming out in June, right? Delayed again. How the fuck? After a hundred years, the Nintendo 64 DD finally launched on December 1st, 1999. But at this point, nobody cared especially Nintendo. They already knew it was going to be a commercial failure and sold it only by mail order in Japan. Maybe 10,000 units were shipped out to some unlucky people. It never had a chance to thrive and perhaps it didn't deserve to. Most of the planned games were either cancelled, released for the N64 with storage increases like you saw with DK64, or ported to other consoles. So at the very least, Nintendo was able to save the most important parts of their work. Only 10 games were ever released for it. The 64DD was a case of ambition without direction. Had it come out well before the GameCube was announced, it might have had moderate success, but Nintendo just couldn't nail down a direction or meet deadlines. Nowadays, mobile gaming is one of the most popular, be it the 3DS or your phone. But one company tried to bridge the gap by making a portable phone that was also a game console. Introducing the Nokia N-Gage. Jack of two trades, master of neither. The goal was to snatch some gamers away from the Game Boy Advance. Because hey kids, it's also a phone! <laughs> Problem is, the button layout that worked for cell phones in the early 2000s isn't gonna work for playing games. Look at all this shit. It's worse than the Jaguar controller. Not to mention it was 300 bucks. The Game Boy Advance sold for $100 two years prior. Surprisingly, 2 million were sold, but only 58 games ever came out. Nowadays, they have this crazy new product that can play video games and be a cell phone. It's called a cell phone. There are far more failed gaming consoles out there than successful ones, and we could go down the rabbit hole until we hit Wonderland. As you step out on my magic school bus, I want to ask, what did you learn? Hopefully you learned something about the games industry, and what a difficult market it can be. Perhaps you'll reflect on some of these old consoles and maybe a bit of nostalgia will hit you. So why did these consoles fail? A lot of times, there was a better alternative that was cheaper and well established. Or the hardware was poorly designed, prone to failure. Perhaps the goal wasn't clear to consumers and some of this shit was just too overpriced to be worth the risk. A failed console might have made a bad first impression, had a confusing identity or lackluster lineup of games. Because great ideas don't always translate to great products. Even giants like Apple and Google couldn't break in. These are some of the reasons why game consoles fail. Many have tried, and most have failed. Such is the rough life of the console gaming market. But what do you think? Which of these consoles was the worst? Do you have fond memories of any of them? Let me know in the comments below. That's all I got for today, folks. This is the Act Man, signing out. Peace!